Eukaryotic microbes include some species of algae, all protozoa, some species of fungi, all lichens, and all slime molds. The first eukaryote that we will be discussing is algae. Algae are photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms that are classified in the second kingdom protista. All algal cells consist of cytoplasm, a cell wall, a cell membrane, a nucleus, plastids, ribosomes, mitochondria, and Golgi bodies. Some algal cells have a pellicle or a thickened cell membrane. A stigma or a light sensing organelle also known as the eye spot and or flagella. So uh, algal cells are not plants but they are more plant-like than protozoa. Uh, algaes do not have true roots, stems, and leaves. They are arranged in size from small unicellular microscopic organisms, for example the atoms and dinoflagellates, to large multicellular plant-like seaweeds. They may be arranged in colonies or strands. So algaes can be found in fresh water, in salt water, in wet soil, and on wet rocks. Algae produce their energy by photosynthesis. So they are using the energy from the sun, uh, carbon dioxide, water, and other inorganic nutrients from the soil to build their own cellular materials. Most algal cells contain cellulose. From our last uh, lecture, we have discussed that cellulose is a polysaccharide not found in cell walls of any other microorganisms. And depending on the types of photosynthetic pigments they possess, uh, algaes are classified as green, golden, brown, or red. Algae are an important source of food, of iodine, and other minerals uh, for fertilizers, emulsifiers, and stabilizers, for example, for ice cream. They are also gelling agent for jams and nutrient media for bacterial growth. We often use uh, the agar in the laboratory as solidifying agent. And agars are made up of uh, red marine alga. And because uh, algae are nearly 50% oil, they are being studied as a source of biofuels. But on the downside, damage to water system is frequently caused by algae clogging filters and, and pipes if uh, many nutrients are present. Algae are only very rarely a cause of human infections. Prototycosis is an example of a human algal infection. But algae and several other genera secrete toxic substances called the phycotoxins. Uh, this is when, in, when ingested, this is poisonous to humans, fish, and other animals. And if ingested by humans, the phycotoxins produce the dinoflagellates that cause the red tides. And this can lead to disease called paralytic shellfish poisoning. This is one clinical manifestation of uh, the prototecosis. So, the prototheca lives in soil and can enter the wounds, especially those located on the feet. And this will produce a small subcutaneous lesion that can progress to a crusty, warty looking lesion. If the organism enters the lymphatic system, it may cause a debilitating and sometimes fatal infection especially for those individuals that are immunocompromised. Again, prototecosis is a rare kind of disease. Red tide is common in many parts of the Philippines. So this causes the paralytic shellfish poisoning. The symptoms typically appear 30 to 60 minutes after ingesting toxic shellfish, but this can be delayed for several hours the patient usually complain of numbness, tingling of the face, lips, tongue, arms, and legs. There are nausea, vomiting, uh, headache, and diarrhea. And on severe cases, depending on how large the doses of toxin was ingested, the clinical features usually are ataxia, dysphagia, mental status changes, flaccid paralysis, and respiratory failure. This is how humans are infected by the uh, dinoflagellates. So the dinoflagellates hatch, they become resting cysts, 
and these cysts are being filtered out by the shellfish, then the shellfish are being ingested by humans. Now we'll move on to protozoa. Together with algae, protozoa are classified in the second kingdom, protista. So they are uh, non-photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms. Most of the protozoa are unicellular and free-living and they are found in soil and water. So most protozoa are more animal-like than plant-like. All protozoa cells possess a variety of eukaryotic structures and organelles. They do not have chlorophyll and therefore they cannot make their own food by photosynthesis. Some protozoa ingest whole algae, yeast, bacteria and smaller protozoans as their source of nutrients while others live on dead and decaying organic matters. Protozoa do not have cell walls but they possess a pellicle which serves the same purpose as a cell wall for protection. Some flagellates and ciliates ingest food through a primitive mouth or opening called a cystostome. A typical protozoan life cycle consists of two stages, the trophozoite stage and the cyst stage. The trophozoite is a motile feeding dividing stage in a protozoan life cycle, whereas the cyst is a non-motile, dormant survival stage. In some ways, like the presence of a thick outer wall, cysts are like bacterial spores. Some protozoa are parasites. So parasitic protozoa break down and absorb nutrients from the body of the host in which they live. And many parasitic protozoa are pathogens. They cause human diseases such as malaria, gardiasis, and trypanosomiasis. Protozoa are sometimes classified taxonomically by their mode of locomotion. Some move by pseudopodia, others by flagella, others by cilia, and some are non-motile. So these are the groups in which uh, the protozoa can be divided based on locomotion. First is amoebae. They move by means of pseudopodia or false feet. Example are Entamoeba histolytica, this caused the amoebic dysentery. Another um, group are the ciliates, they move by means of hair like cilia. Example is Balantidium coli, which causes balantidiasis. Another is flage flagellates, they move by means of whip like flagella. Example is Gardialamblia, that causes the gardiasis. Another is sporozoa. Uh, they have no visible means of locomotion. Example is plasmodium species, which cause malaria. So now we'll discuss some of the protozoal diseases in detail. By the way, whenever we want to uh, search for a comprehensive discussion of every communicable disease or infectious disease, we always look it up from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or CDC website. No, that's where we can uh, look for the comprehensive discussion of all the infectious diseases. So this is like the, um, the Bible when it comes to communicable diseases. So first, protozoal disease is dysentery. This is caused by Entamoeba histolytica. This is an inflammatory disorder of the intestine, especially the colon. So, uh, when we are suspecting dysentery, we look for clinical manifestations such as diarrhea that contain mucus and or blood in the feces. If left untreated, dysentery can be fatal due to massive dehydration. Look at this picture. Uh, this is the life cycle of the entamoeba histolytica. Look at number one. This is the first stage of the cycle. Cysts and trophozoites are passed in the feces. Cysts are typically found in form stool, whereas trophozoites are typically found in diarrheal stool. Then infection by entamoeba histolytica occurs by ingestion of mature cysts. Look at number two. Take note that the only 
uh, infectious stage in an uh, in entamoeba histolytica is the mature cyst kasi trophozoites do not uh, survive outside the body that long and it cannot withstand the gastric acidity so mature cyst lang yung kaya mag mag withstand sa ganong adverse environment we can ingest the mature cyst in fecally contaminated food, water, or hands. Then, look at number three, existation occurs. Nawawala yung balot ng cyst. Then, marirelease yung trophozoite. Once the trophozoites are released in the small intestine, uh, it will multiply by binary fission, remember, no, to produce trophozoites and cyst again. Then, both stages are passed in the feces and the cycle continues. Another protozoal disease is Balantidiasis. This is caused by Balantidium coli. Take note that this is the only ciliate known to be capable of infecting humans. Swine are the primary reservoir host, but humans can also be reservoir. Most cases are asymptomatic, but clinical manifestations uh, when present may be acute or chronic with abdominal symptoms associated with diarrhea or dysentery. Cysts are the stage responsible for transmission of balantidiasis. First, the host, either human or swine, uh, ingests the contaminated food or water that contains the cyst. Then following ingestion, existation occurs in the small intestine and trophozoites colonize the large intestine. Trophozoites usually reside in the lumen of the large intestine and appendix of humans and animals. Then, they replicate by binary fission. Trophozoites undergo encystation to produce infective cysts. Look at number 5. Some trophozoites invade the wall of the colon and multiply, causing ulcerative pathology to the colon wall. Then, mature cysts are passed with feces. The next protozoal disease is Gardiasis. This is caused by Gardia lamblia. This infection occurs from eating food or drinking water contaminated by the cysts that are very resistant form. This is usually passed from the feces. So chronic infection may result in malnourishment, blocking absorption of food across their intestinal wall. So looking at this life cycle, the infection occurs by the ingestion of cysts in contaminated water, food, or by fecal oral route. In the small intestine, existation releases trophozoites. So each, each cyst produces two, two trophozoites. Trophozoites multiply by longitudinal binary fission remaining in the lumen of the proximal small bowel. Then look at number 4. Encystation occurs as the parasite transit towards the colon. So makikita natin yung cyst most commonly in non-diarrheal feces. And because the cysts are infectious when passed in the stool or shortly afterward, person-to-person -person transmission is possible. The last protozoal disease is malaria. This is life-threatening disease caused by Plasmodium malariae. This is a parasite transmitted through the bites of infected mosquitoes. The symptoms include fever, chills, and flu-like illness. If left untreated, this can cause coma and death if uh, it progresses to cerebral malaria. The malaria parasite life cycle involves two hosts, the Anopheles mosquito and the human. The life cycle of malaria starts during a blood meal uh, from a malaria-infected female Anopheles mosquito uh, where there is an inoculated sporozoite. Then uh, it will be inoculated into the human host. The sporozoites infect the liver cells and mature into schizons. Look at number three. This will rupture and release merozoites. After this initial replication in the liver, look at letter A, the parasites undergo a sexual multiplication in the erythrocytes, look at letter B. 
So, merozoites infect the red blood cells. The ring stage trophozoites mature into schizonts with rupture releasing merozoites. Then, some parasites differentiate into sexual erythrocytic stage or the gametocytes. Look at number 7. So, this is the blood stage of the parasite. And he, uh, here we can already see the clinical manifestations of the disease. The gametocytes may be male or microgametocytes and female or macrogametocytes. Look at number 8. They are ingested by an anophilus mosquito during a blood meal. The parasite's multiplication in the mosquito is known as the sporogonic cycle. Well, the mosquito, uh, while in the mosquito stomach, the microgametes penetrate the macrogametes, generating zygotes. The zygotes in turn become motile and elongated. Look at number 10. This will invade the mid-gut wall of the mosquito where they develop into oocysts. The oocysts grow, rupture, and release porosoids, which make their way to the mosquito's salivary glands and inoculation of the sporocytes uh, into a human host perpetuates the malaria life cycle. Now we'll move on to the third eukaryotic microbe, fungi. The study of uh, fungi is called mycology. Fungi are a very diverse group and they are classified across three kingdoms. And those that are pathogenic to humans and animals are placed in the kingdom fungi or eumycota. Fungi are found almost everywhere. Some are saprophytic, they are living on organic matter in water and soil, and others are parasitic, they live on and within animals and plants. Some are harmful and some are beneficial. Fungi also live in many unlikely materials, so if you see a whitish material on leather, on plastics and spoilage of jams, they are caused by fungi. Beneficial fungi are important in the production of cheese, beer, wine, and other food, as well as drugs and antibiotics. Fungi are called the garbage disposers of nature because they secrete uh, digestive enzymes into dead plants and animals so that they will decompose and their materials will be absorbable nutrients. They are also uh, coined as the original recyclers of nature. Fungi are sometimes incorrectly referred to as plants, but they are not. So, one way that fungi differ from plants and algae is that they are not photosynthetic. They do not have chlorophyll and other photosynthetic pigments. Fungal cell walls contain a polysaccharide called chitin, we have discussed this before. This is not found in the cell walls of any other microorganism except for fungi and the uh, exoskeletons of arthropods. Although many fungi are unicellular, for example, these and microsporidia, others grow as filaments called hyphae. This intertwine to form a mass called as mycelium. Some fungi have septate hyphae, meaning that the cytoplasm within the hypha is divided into cells by cross walls or septa, whereas others have aseptate hyphae, meaning that the cytoplasm within the hypha is not divided into cells, so no septa. Learning whether the fungus possesses septate or aseptate hyphae is an important clue when attempting to identify a fungus that has been isolated from a clinical specimen. Depending on the particular species, fungal cells can reproduce by budding, hyphal extension, or the formation of spores. There are two general categories of fungal spores, asexual spores and sexual spores. Sexual spores are produced by the fusion of two gametes or the fusion of two nuclei. They have a variety of names depending on the exact number in which they are formed. On the other hand, uh, asexual spores are formed in many different uh, ways but not by the fusion of gametes.
Asexual fungal spores are known as conidia or spores depending upon how they are formed. Fungal spores and conidia, conidia are very uh, resistant structures that are carried in great distances by wind. They are resistant to heat, to cold, to acids, bases, and other chemicals. And many people are allergic to fungal spores. This slide just shows a cross-section of a petri dish with the culture medium that we usually use in the laboratory to grow fungal colonies. So, like in the picture below, under the microscope, we can see and identify if the fungal uh, specimen has septum or if they are a septate. The taxonomic classification of fungi has undergone significant changes but one current classification divides the kingdom fungi into five phyla. Classification of fungi into this phyla is based primarily on their mode of sexual reproduction. Uh, but uh, we don't really have to be very osy about it, no? We just uh, need to know that some fungi classification schemes contain phylum called the deuteromycotina or the deuteromycetes that include the medically important molds such as uh, aspergillus and the yeast such as candida albicans. These fungi in this phylum have uh, no mode of sexual reproduction or the mode of sexual reproduction is not known. A few fungi, including some human pathogens, can live either as yeast or as molds depending on growth conditions. This phenomenon is called dimorphism and the organisms are referred to as dimorphic fungi. So when growing in the body or in vivo in a temperature uh, within 37 degrees Celsius, dimorphic fungi exist as unicellular yeast and produce yeast colonies. However, when growing in the environment or in vitro at room temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, Dimorphic fungi exist as molds producing mold colonies or mycelia. The dimorphic fungi that cause diseases in humans include uh, Histoplasma capsulatum, this causes histoplasmosis, the sporotrich shenki, this causes sporotrichosis, the one that causes coccidiodomycosis, and the one that causes blastomycosis. Yeast are eukaryotic single-celled organisms that lack mycelia. Individual cells, yeast cells, sometimes referred to as blastospores or blastoconidia, can be observed only through a microscope. They usually produce by budding, but occasionally do so by a type of spore formation. Sometimes, a string of elongated bodies form. This string of elongated bodies is called a pseudohypa. So it resembles a hypha, but it is not a hypha, hence pseudo or not true. Some yeast produce thick-walled spore-like structures called chlamydospores or chlamydoconidia. This is a microscopic examination of a culture of candida albicans. You can see the letter A are the chlamydospores, letter B are pseudohyphae, elongated these cells that are linked end to end and you can see letter C is a budding yeast cell or blastospores. Yeast are found in soil and water and on the skins of many fruits and vegetables. For centuries they have been used to make wine and beer. The common yeast Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae or baker's yeast ferments sugar to alcohol under anaerobic conditions. Another notable kind of yeast is the Candida albicans. Uh, this is the yeast that is most frequently isolated from human clinical specimens. In the laboratory, yeast produce colonies that are quite similar in appearance to bacterial colonies. So to distinguish between a yeast colony from a bacterial colony, we should use a wet mount and uh, wear 
a small portion of the colony is mixed with a drop of water or saline uh, on a microscope slide then the preparation is examined under the microscope and alternatively the preparation can be stained using the gram staining procedure you can note the following when uh, distinguishing yeast from bacteria yeast are usually larger than bacteria and are usually oval shaped some may be observed in the process of budding and bacteria do not produce buds Another category of fungi is the molds. They are the fungi often seen in water and soil and on food. They grow in the form of cytoplasmic filaments or hyphae that make up the mycelium of the mold. Some of the hyphae are called aerial hyphae that extend above the surface of whatever the mold is growing on and some are called vegetative hyphae that are beneath the surface. The large fungi that are encountered in forests such as mushrooms, toadstools, puffballs, and bracket fungi are collectively referred to as a fleshy fungi. Obviously, they are not microorganisms. Mushrooms are a class of true fungi that consists of a network of filaments or strands that grow into the soil or in a rotting log and a fruiting body. They form and release spores. Many mushrooms are edible, but others, including some that resemble edible fungi, are extremely toxic and may cause permanent liver and brain damage or death if ingested. Fungal infections of humans are also called mycosis. It is more likely that uh, we get fungal infection whenever we have weakened immune system and in uh, medical conditions such as in cases of cancers, in acute uh, immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS and diabetes. And fungi can be difficult to kill, but for local and uh, nail infections, we usually give medications that are applied directly to the infected area. And uh, oral antifungal medicines, we reserve this for serious infections. Fungal infections of humans are categorized as superficial, cutaneous, subcutaneous, or systemic mycosis. Superficial mycosis are fungal infections of the outermost areas of the human body, such as the hair, the fingernails, toenails, and the dead layers of the skin, the epidermis. On the other hand, cutaneous mycosis are fungal infections of the living layers of the skin or the dermis. A group of molds collectively referred to as dermatophytes cause thin infections which are often referred to as ringworm infections. Please note that ringworm infections have absolutely nothing to do with worms. And thin infections are named in accordance with the part of the anatomy that is infected. For example, tinea pedis cause athlete's foot, tinea ungium is uh, the cause of fingernails and toenails infection. Tinea capitis is for the scalp, tinea barbe is for the face and neck, tinea corporis is for the trunk of the body, and tinea cruris is for the groin area. One medically important mycosis is caused by the candida albicans. This is an opportunistic yeast that lives harmlessly on the skin and mucous membrane of the mouth, and GI, and the uh, genitourinary tract. However, when conditions cause a reduction in the number of indigenous bacteria in these anatomic locations, candida albicans uh, become uh, many in number. This will lead to yeast infection of the mouth, like the thrush, in the skin and the vagina, vaginal area, as yeast vaginitis. That's why when we have patients who use oral inhaled corticosteroids, we instruct them to brush their teeth after inhalation of medication to avoid oral thrush. Vaginal infections, on the other hand, is common among patients with diabetes. Subcutaneous and systemic mycosis are more severe types of mycosis. Subcutaneous mycosis are fungal infections of the dermis and underlying tissues. 
These infections usually arise from traumatic implantation of the organism into the subcutaneous tissue. An example is Madure foot, in which the patient's foot becomes covered with large and sightly fungus-containing bumps. Systemic or generalized mycosis are fungal infections of internal organs of the body, sometimes affecting two or more different organ systems simultaneously. The spores or conidia of some pathogenic fungi may be inhaled with dust uh, from contaminated soil or dried bird or bat feces, and they may, be, uh, they may also enter through wounds of the hands and feet. Because mycosis are opportunistic kind of uh, microorganisms, immunocompromised individuals are very susceptible to this kind of infections. Examples of deep-seated pulmonary infections include blastomycosis, coccidiomycosis, cryptococcosis, and histoplasmosis. All of these are common among AIDS patients. Inhalation of common bread molds like rhizopus and mucor species can cause disease and even death in immunocompromised uh, patients. The diagnosis of mycosis is accomplished by culture techniques and immunodiagnostic procedures. For yeast, they are identified using a series of biochemical tests. For molds, they are identified using a combination of macroscopic and microscopic observations. Blastomycosis is one common disease among immunocompromised. This is caused by fungus Blastomyces dermatitidis found in soil in the central and eastern U.S. This is not common in the Philippines. The infection occurs by inhalation of spores, and once inhaled, the fungus grows and may disseminate through blood to other organs. Pulmonary blastidiomycosis usually uh, resolves on its own for most people. But uh, among immune compromised patients, they can cause respiratory failure. Disseminated plastidiomycosis, uh, if disseminates from the lungs, they can cause wart like or recessed skin lesions, or that is called cutaneous plastidiomycosis, or damage to bones, or uh, what we call the os osteoarticular plastidiomycosis. Among AIDS patients, uh, they are prone to develop meningitis from disinfection. Another opportunistic fungal pathogen is caused by Aspergillus fumigatus. This causes the disease Aspergillosis. This is uh, one of the leading infectious cause of death in leukemia and bone marrow transplant patients. This can result in allergic reaction, pulmonary mass, systemic infection, and can also exacerbate asthma. Again, the things that increase a person's risk of experiencing opportunistic mycosis are first, invasive medical procedures. Second, medical therapies that weaken the immune system like use of corticosteroids and chemotherapy. And third, certain pre-existing conditions or immunocompromised individuals like cancers, diabetes, and AIDS. Lichens and slime molds are both classified as proteased. Lichens are observed as colored, often circular patches on tree trunks and rocks. For many years, it was thought that a lichen represents a combination of two organisms, an alga or a cyanobacterium and a filamentous fungus, living together in such a mutualistic relationship that they appear to be one organism. But recent evidence suggests that a third organism, a yeast, may also be present embedded in the cortex of the lichen. And uh, lichens are not associated with human disease. Slime molds, on the other hand, are also found in soil and on rotting logs. They have both fungal and protozoal characteristics and have recently been transferred out of the uh, kingdom fungi and is placed in the kingdom protozoa. They are not molds. They are not known to cause human disease. Now we'll move on to helminths or worms. Although helminths are not microorganisms, their microscopic stages, their eggs and larvae, 
in the life cycle of these parasites are medically important. Helminths infect humans, other animals, and plants, but only helminth infections of humans will be given emphasis in this lecture. Helminths are multicellular eukaryotic organisms in the kingdom Animalia. The typical helminth life cycle includes three stages, the egg, the larva, and the adult worm. They receive nourishment and protection while disrupting their hosts, and nutrients absorption, causing weakness and disease. Many types of helminths love in the digestive tract of their host. These are referred to as intestinal parasites. This is just an overview of the common parasitic infections in humans. We have a separate discussion for parasites. The first element are hookworms. There are two species commonly infecting humans, Ancyclostoma duodenale and Nicator americanus. The life cycle of hookworms start with eggs that are passed in the stool, and under favorable condition, the larvae hatch in one to two days and become free living in contaminated soil. These released shibdidiform larvae grow in the feces or in the soil and after 5 to 10 days they become filariform or the third stage larvae that are infective. This infective larvae can survive 3 to 4 weeks in favorable environment. So on contact with the human host, typically bare feet, the larvae penetrate the skin and are carried through the blood vessels to the heart and then to the lungs. From the lungs, they ascend to the bronchial tree to the pharynx and then they are swallowed. Then the larvae reach the jejunum of the small intestine where they reside and mature into adults. So adult worms live in the lumen of the small intestine, typically the distal jejunum. Take note that the small intestines are very vascular and therefore where, when they attach to the intestinal wall, this will result to blood loss by the host and will cause anemia, loss of iron and protein, and damaged mucosa. Most adult worms are eliminated in one to two years, but uh, this may reach several years. This is how hookworms appear on electron microscope. And on the right, this is an example of a cutaneous larva migrans. The next helmet are tapeworms. These are parasitic nematode worm that lives in small intestine of host. Tiniasis is the infection of humans with the adult tapeworm of tinea saginata or tinea solium. People with tiniasis usually have mild or absent symptoms. Tinea solium tapeworm infection can lead to cysticercosis, a disease that can cause seizures, so it is important to seek treatment. Humans are the only definitive host for tinea saginata and tinea solium. The life cycle uh, starts when eggs or gravid proglotids are passed uh, with the feces. The eggs can survive for days to months in the environment. So the cattle and pigs become infected by ingesting vegetation contaminated with eggs or gravid proglotids. In the animal's intestine, the oncospheres hatch, invade the intestinal wall, and migrate to the striated muscles where they develop into cysticerci. So this cysticercus can survive for several years in the animal. Humans become infected by ingesting raw or uncooked infected meat. Once we ingest it, in the human intestine, the cysticercus develops over two months into an adult tapeworm, which can survive for years. The adult tapeworms attach to the small intestine by their scolex and reside in the small intestine. The adults produce proglotids, which mature and become gravid, they detach from the tapeworm and they migrate to the anus or are passed in the stool. The eggs contained in the gravid proglotids are released after the proglotids are passed with the feces. So tinea saginata may produce up to 100,000 uh, and tinea solium may produce 50,000 eggs per proglotid and that's a lot of eggs. This is how a tapeworm looks like. 
Take note of the scolex. This is what they use to attach the small intestine. Uh, if you are going to differentiate other helmets from tapeworms, always look for the proglotids. This is a characteristic of the tapeworms. So this is an example of an intestinal tapeworm. That's the end of the lecture. Thank you for listening.